I want to start by saying thank you to Holly Peters, a listener who recommended that I read a book called Humble Inquiry by Edgar Schein. It's a book that I think every person on the planet should read. It's a book about the importance of drawing out people, about building relationships by asking genuinely curious questions. So why do I think it's an important book? From a personal communications perspective, I think parents, like me, need to be able to talk to our kids so that they talk back. We need to have our kids talk to us, especially when things go wrong. And I'm happy that, for me, my father, I believe, was a pioneer in in what Ed Schein calls humble inquiry. My dad didn't know it at the time, but he certainly was an expert. He would ask me a question after question and Not like he was interrogating me. His questions were out of pure curiosity. And if he sensed that a subject was important to me, he'd ask about it and he'd follow up. And the follow-up questions always demonstrated to me that he was listening and listening extremely carefully. And I got to say, that made me feel good. It made me feel like he wanted to know more and he wanted to know about my life. And that built a very close relationship with my dad. So humble inquiry is a skill that I think is important to every parent. From an organizational perspective, I think a boss needs to be able to talk to their subordinates so that teams feel comfortable sharing critical information. In fact, the success of a company depends on it. Everyone in an organization needs to feel like they can tell their boss what's really going on so that the boss can assist them and assist their boss. When organizations are able to communicate in that way, there's far less rework and fewer mistakes. So for me, this is a book that helps us to create a climate where it's safe to tell the truth, whether that's in families or in organizations. So Humble Inquiry is a book that really resonated with me, and that's why I invited the author Edgar Schein for today's interview. He's a retired professor, Professor Emeritus at MIT Sloan School of Management. He's basically the founder of an entire field called organizational development. And he says that this book, Humble Inquiry, it's the culmination of his life's work. So if you're only reading one book of his, this is the one that you should be reading. So Ed, I know that you're fully retired now. He's on the line with me now. And I can't express to you how much I appreciate you agreeing to this interview. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm always happy to talk about the books I write. Yes, the the multiple books that you've written. So in the book, you define humble inquiry as, and I'm going to quote it, the skill and the art of drawing someone out, of asking questions to which you don't already know the answer, of building a relationship based on curiosity and interest in the other person. And for me, I'm one of those people that understands concepts through stories. And I loved in your book that you included a bunch of case studies for us to understand really what it means to be using humble inquiry. So could you share one of your favorite ones from the book? Well, the the one that really triggered the book was when I was out uh, near my, uh, where I'm living in Palo Alto at my retirement center, there had been a rain and uh, some really very fascinating bunches of mushrooms were growing around one of the big trees. And I happened to know about mushrooms because my German mother taught me all about them. I knew what was edible and what was not. And this lady came up with her little dog, stood over me, pointed a long finger at me and said, those are poisonous, you know. I looked up at her and said, yes, I I do know that. (laughs) And she said, with great authority, they can kill you, you know. And at that moment, you know, I really got angry, not at her, but at the whole concept that she was living by, namely that you really, that really the way to live is to tell people things, save them from their own disaster or whatever. And I was reminded that one of the worst memories I had from my teaching days was when I would ask students, uh, usually uh, already young executives, what did it mean when you were first promoted to be a manager? And they said, without a moment's hesitation, it meant that I could now tell other people what to do. Those two things together made me realize we are deeply embedded in a culture of tell, 
tell, tell. And what's really missing is ask and find out. You know, it, so that was the trigger. Yeah, it's interesting that you said that story. It, it reminds me just last week, literally just last week, I was at an event with my children and it was a public speaking event. And after the event, one of the judges stood up and made a comment, which I totally disagreed with. And in my mind, I don't know what happened. I kind of snapped into, oh, I'm the public speaker. And I, I felt this urge to go over to the one of the judges and share with him why he was so wrong. And afterwards, my children were like, Mom, are you crazy? <laughs> what are you doing? And after I walked out, I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, I totally burnt that relationship. I don't do what I tell people to do. I don't know what happened. It just jumped out of me. So how do people try to be following humble inquiry, particularly in moments like that where you, you're not thinking, you're stressed, you're, in that case it wasn't stressed, but maybe you're, you're in a hurry. So how does one do that? Well, I, I think the reason the word humble uh, enters the vocabulary here is because I think before we speak or tell, we really have to ask ourselves, do I know? I think the, the trap is we think that somehow expressing an opinion is good. It, it gives us status. And we tend, therefore, to be glib and quick in saying what we think we know and failing to ask in ourselves, you know, do we really know? And why do I think it's appropriate for me to tell? Let me switch to a different analogy. People often ask me, how do we learn to do this? To which I respond, we already know how to do it. It's that we misjudge the requirements of the setting. So when we think of ourselves when we were young and uh, dating each other, we were very good at humble inquiry. We wanted to find out what the other person really was like. So we got very good at asking questions. That same skill somehow gets lost when we become adults and managers and parents. But the skill is still there if we can just define the situation as one where I'd really like to know, for example, in the case of your speaker, wouldn't it be interesting to know why he has a position that is so different from yours? Instead of saying, you know, I disagree, why not say, help me understand why you took that point of view? Uh, that would be a very interesting question to be asking Donald Trump. Instead <laughs> of arguing with him, ask him, how did you arrive at this position? Tell me the logic behind it. Let us get curious about this man and his, his strange opinions. So how can we use humble inquiry, or why is humble inquiry important in terms of the teams and organizations? I, so far, we're talking about it more in personal settings. Well, it's, it's most important because <clears throat> what I've observed is that nowadays, what teams and managers and organizations face is very complex, difficult, systemic problems. And the truth of, of their reality, whether you're the chairman of the team or you're a team member or the boss, you don't really actually know enough to tell, to make decisions. So what's, what's happened, I think, in the last 25 years is problem complexity and the tasks that people have to perform have gotten too difficult for individual managers or leaders to be able to say what, what should be done. So the, the real humility is humility in the face of complexity. Humility doesn't mean I have to humiliate myself and admit that you know more than I do. Humility in this world is, I really don't know enough, period, to make decisions. So I've got to learn how to inquire and get the information I need from my bosses, from my peers, 
from my subordinates and to create a situation where maybe collectively we can figure it out. But abandon this notion that just because I have the position, therefore I have the answer. That's the trap. So is this a skill that can be taught? And if so, how do you teach it? Well, I go back to my earlier comment. I think we have the skill. We just don't apply it <clears throat> in our work situations. When we're trying to build a friendship, uh, <clears throat> if we're single and we're dating, we use that skill very much in our daily relations. So the question is, why do we think that when we're in a business situation or in a team situation, we should treat it differently than when we're in a friendship building situation. It's the same skill. It's just the trap that we don't think of applying it in the work situation. But how, how would you do that? Can you be more specific? T tell me, I am a senior leader and I want to teach <laughs> the people who work with me how to do this. What do I do? Well, the first thing is I start practicing it. Before I teach it, I have to be it. I have to do it. And the, the simplest way, which actually goes back to a lot of management theories, you bring your subordinate in and say, on this particular problem that we're working on, uh, tell me what you're doing. Uh, what's your approach to it? Uh, uh, why don't you come in uh, every uh, every week or so and just bring me up to date. Uh, I'm really curious how it's going. Uh, if a manager just does that simple routine, it used to be sort of called management by objectives. You know, let's set objectives together and then I won't micromanage you. I'll just ask you from time to time, you know, how you're doing and what you're doing and how you're approaching it. I think that skill is there. It's, again, a mindset of when, when do I need to do it? And the answer is the minute things get complicated and you no longer have all the answers, then you start asking questions. Now, if you do that with your subordinates, they will catch on and do it with their subordinates. But the, the main thing is not to think of teaching it, but to do it you know, and to display by doing it what it's all about. All right. So I have a question. In your book, you defined different types of inquiry. You had uh, exploratory, diagnostic, confrontational, and process-oriented. Can you just fairly briefly talk about those different types and how they may hurt or help the development of a relationship? Yeah, it, I realized when I, I said, well, we should become more curious and ask questions. And I realized this long time ago in my earlier books on process consultation, that when a consultant goes in and asks questions to find out what the, the client's issues are, you have a lot of choices of what you ask about. So the most fundamental choice is what I ended up calling humble inquiry, which is just what's on your mind. Tell me. Tell me your story. I have no preconceptions. I just want to know what's on your mind. If they're finished with that part and, you know, kind of they've run dry, they've told you their problem as they see it. Uh, someone calls me up and says, I, I want you to help me uh, develop a, uh, a program for changing my culture. I now have a, a choice to make. Do I just say, tell me more, which is humble inquiry, or I could say, why do you want to do that? If I say, why do you want to do that? I have shifted to what I call the diagnostic question because I'm now probing the person's uh, reasons, or I might say, what have you done so far? Or I might even say, how do, you, how do you feel about what you've just told me? Those are all partly now my agenda. 
my curiosity. So I'm now beginning to influence the story. And maybe the other person wants to tell me that or may not want to tell me that. But we're now, you know, in it together. I've asserted myself through the kind of diagnostic question I've asked. And then I may also get ideas about what should be done or could be done. So a third level of question, we've now done humble inquiry, diagnostic inquiry, a third level would be, well, why don't you consider doing a survey or why don't you bring in some interviewers to talk to uh, different people in your organization? If I let out my idea in the form of a suggestion or a question that has a suggestion in it, I am now being what I would think of as much more confrontative. I'm now saying, you know, not only have I listened to your story, but I have an input to that story. Here's something you might think about doing. So the balance between just pure inquiry, asking diagnostic questions, and making suggestions is, I think, where the skill comes in of how to be curious and how to ask. And then one other level of questions might be just to ask about the process itself. I could say, well, uh, how are you feeling about our conversation? Should I be asking you some questions or should I be doing something different? That escalates the whole thing to let's examine what we're doing here together. Uh, a parent with a child uh, the child comes with a math problem, a humble inquiry would be to not deal with the math problem at all, but to say, uh, tell me more, because maybe the math problem is just the lead-in to what the kid really wants to talk about it. Or diagnostically, I could say, well, tell me more about why you're having the problem with this, with this math. Or uh, suggestion might be, well, have you tried uh, adding those numbers together? Or I can say process-wise, um, well, what shall we talk about? I could escalate it to we're having a talk here, uh, and how do you want to handle it? Those are all different types of questions with different consequences. And I think we, if we become an inquirer, we kind of need to learn when do I ask which kind of question. Is there anything that you'd like to share with us from your book? Are there any important points that I missed that you'd like the audience to hear? I guess the, the main thing that, that I've observed and that I would like audiences to hear is that we should think about the value of curiosity. Uh, I think the more complicated the world gets, the more we are in danger of thinking we know and thinking we know how to solve problems. The reality is the, the unknown unknown is what's really dangerous. And the only way we can tackle the, the known unknown, as well as the unknown unknown, is to begin to ask more questions. Uh, generally, uh, ask yourself, you know, when should I be asking a question because something isn't clear to me? Uh, do, it, do it with the helps that uh, are already in the computer. It's amazing how much we can learn from Wikipedia. Uh, but it's a mindset to ask instead of tell. If you can just keep reminding yourself over and over again, ask instead of tell. Ask your friends, ask the experts, ask Wikipedia, but get in that habit. I think that's maybe the big message. See, if I say that to my kids, they're going to want me to give them an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could tell them to 
to go to the library and look at this <laughs> old thing called an encyclopedia. Uh, uh, you know what? Dictionary. Uh, you know what, Ed? In my in my living room, I have a set of encyclopedias, and I also have a a a dictionary. And we still, I mean, of course, we don't look things up in the encyclopedias, but we still use the dictionary. When the kids ask, I say, "Go over and look it up." <laughs> so. Old school. I think it's important to ask and to, to have that sense of curiosity. So I can't thank you enough again for agreeing to this interview. I It was truly an honor to speak with you, and I'm grateful for your knowledge, and I'm hoping that all of us can learn to ask more questions and to be more curious. I also want to thank Holly Peters, the listener of the podcast that recommended Humble Inquiry to me via Goodreads. And by the way, she also helped to develop some of the questions that were asked today. If you have a book or an author that you think would be a good fit for the show, please let me know via email or through Goodreads. This is Lisa B. Marshall and today with Ed Shine, moving you from mediocre to memorable, from information to influence, and from worker to leader.